shot. Look at the debris. Look at all the debris. Look at all the debris in the air. But this is a very dangerous situation for South Oklahoma City. Folks that live in the Kingfisher. You're not there. It's moving up. Uh, leading edge of the city near the south end. Area in the half. Early on the morning of May 3rd, 1999, the Storm Prediction Center issued a slight risk for severe weather in areas ranging from North Texas to South Dakota, highlighting the risk for large hail, damaging winds, and isolated tornadoes. By 7 a.m. Central Daylight Time, Cape values had exceeded 4,000 joules per kilogram, an amount more than favorable for severe thunderstorms to form. Given the new information, at 11.15 a.m., the SPC showed a moderate risk for a large portion of central Oklahoma. It was also noted that the conditions in the atmosphere would provide sufficient shear in a few strong to violent tornadic supercells. As the day progressed, the threat for severe weather grew more and more significant. By midday, wind shear had intensified, causing the atmosphere to become highly unstable, and as the warm air above the surface cooled, it had the chance to rise and possibly create thunderstorms. At 3.49 p.m., the SPC added a high risk of severe weather covering much of northern Texas to southern Kansas. The risk included a higher probability of tornadoes of F2 or greater strength. A tornado watch was issued at 4.30 p.m. for majority of Oklahoma, emphasizing the threat of tornadoes, hail as large as 3 inches, wind gusts up to 80 miles per hour, and intense lightning. At roughly 3.20 p.m., a storm formed in Tillman County, Oklahoma. As it traveled northeast, it began to strengthen, becoming severe thunderstorm warned at 4.15 p.m. shortly after entering Comanche County. The storm also began to spin, becoming tornado warned at 4.50 p.m. A minute later, at 4.51, the storm produced two short-lived tornadoes west of Elgin. These two tornadoes were the first of the outbreak and both received an F0 rating. After dropping another three tornadoes, the storm produced a tornado north of Cement at 5.46 p.m. Soon after crossing into Grady County, the tornado grew to about a half a mile wide, and shortly after, a satellite tornado briefly accompanied it for about a mile. Following the dissipation of this tornado, another tornado formed northwest of Chickasha at 6.12 p.m. As the tornado trekked northeast, it grazed the southeastern portions of the Chickasha Municipal Airport while at F2 strength. The tornado dissipated shortly afterwards, after being on the ground for 4.3 miles. The thunderstorm continued northeast, still capable of producing strong tornadoes, and that is exactly what it did next. At 6.26 p.m., a tornado touched down south of Amber, Oklahoma. It grew quickly, reaching nearly a mile in width after being on the ground for only a few miles. As the tornado continued traveling northeast, it increased in strength, reaching F4 intensity shortly before entering Bridge Creek. The tornado had become so strong that it had begun ripping up chunks of grass and dirt, this is called ground scouring. After this, the tornado briefly decreased to F3 strength before re-intensifying as it entered the small community at Bridge Creek, where the tornado would inflict some of its worst damage. The tornado reached its peak strength here, obtaining the highest rating on the Fujita scale, an F5. Also, as the tornado was over Bridge Creek, a mobile Doppler radar recorded a wind speed of 302 miles per hour, the highest measure wind speed ever on Earth. Damage in Bridge Creek was extreme, with many well-built homes being completely swept away, leaving just the foundation. A section of Sand Rock Road had an inch of asphalt scoured off, something only seen in exceptionally strong tornadoes. It had also been observed by damage surveyors that the buildings in Bridge Creek had their debris granulated into extremely small fragments, and small shrubs and bushes had their bark stripped away. The tornado unfortunately took the lives of 12 people in Bridge Creek, nine of which were in mobile homes. At 6.57, as the tornado was exiting Bridge Creek, the National Weather Service issued the first ever tornado emergency for parts of the southern Oklahoma City metro. This new warning was issued to highlight the severity of the situation. Meteorologist David Andrews stated he wanted to paint the picture that a rare and deadly tornado was imminent in the metro area. As the tornado continued northeast at F4 to F5 strength, Many people who were driving on I-44 believed that seeking shelter under an overpass would be their safest choice. This, however, was not true. In 1999, it was widely believed that an overpass was a safe place to be during a tornado. 
when in reality, it is one of the worst places to be. This is because overpasses funnel wind through them causing the wind and debris to move at much higher speeds. This is called the wind tunnel effect. This myth has since been debunked, but many people unfortunately still believe it is true. Several people sheltered under an overpass going over I-44, two of which were Kathleen Walton and her son Levi. While the tornado, which is now at F3 strength, crossed over this overpass, the wind began to pick up, and eventually became too strong for Kathleen to handle. She was sucked out from the overpass and unfortunately lost her life. Levi, however, survived, along with a few other people sheltering with him. The other people who survived suffered severe injuries, and their cars were damaged beyond recognition. The tornado had also picked up and sprayed mud all over the overpass, leaving outlines of the people seeking refuge under it. After the tornado passed, Levi sketched his name in the mud, and it can still be seen to this day 25 years later under that overpass. Kathleen wasn't the only mother who tried to protect her and her kids from the tornado by sheltering under an overpass. This photo shows Tammy Holmgren and her children under an overpass at Newcastle with a tornado looming behind them. Fortunately, the tornado missed the family. Around this time, radar imagery showed that the supercell producing this tornado had an extremely well-defined hook echo, making it stand out from other storms. After this, the tornado decreased in size to about a quarter of a mile wide. During this period, a satellite tornado briefly accompanied the main tornado for several minutes. The tornado was now over mostly open field to F2 intensity, and had transformed into a stovepipe shape. Shortly after crossing the Canadian River into Cleveland County, the tornado began causing F3 damage. Just south of Southwest 149th Street, the tornado crossed over an area that was affected by another EF5 in 2013, making this the only place where an F5 and an EF5 cross paths. A few minutes later, the tornado intensified back to F5 strength as it entered the Country Place Estate subdivision. Here, six people lost their lives and an airplane wing was found nearly 30 miles from the Chickasha Municipal Airport where it originated. The tornado carried on northeast at F4 strength before producing its final swath of F5 damage west of I-35. As the tornado crossed the highway, another person was killed while sheltering under an overpass. Also around this time, while the KFOR news channel was broadcasting the tornado live, weatherman Mike Morgan was left speechless as he watched the tornado. We plead with you, do not take the extra minute or two. We plead with you to get below ground, get in the interior closet or bathroom, get in the bathtub. We plead with you. There it is crossing Interstate 35. There is a tremendous amount of debris in the air. We pray and plead with you, please. Get down now. If you're I-35, get out of your car. If you're east of I-35, over to Taker Air Force Base, please, we plead with you, go to your safe spot now. Take your radio. Forget the live pictures. Go get safe. Oh, my gosh. 89, South 89. I, folks, we plead with you, just go, go to your safe spot. If you before crossing I-240, the tornado crossed over an area that was also affected by an F-4 in 2003. Following this, the tornado began to occlude, slowly turning in a more northern direction. It continued at F-4 strength as it passed less than a mile to the west of Tinker Air Force Base. Shortly after this, the tornado dissipated after being on the ground for an hour and 25 minutes. After the tornado dissipated, a deputy found a 10-month-old baby alive and face down in the mud near her leveled home in Bridge Creek. The baby belonged to Amy Krago, who had her ripped out of her arms by the tornado. You could hear the windows blow out and the house came apart, and it just kind of picked me up and threw me down, said Krago, and then I lost her. Many people now refer to the baby, Aliyah Krago, as the mud baby. The tornado took the lives of 36 people, as well as five people from indirect causes. 583 people were injured, and nearly 10,000 buildings were destroyed, including homes, businesses, and public buildings. $1.2 billion in damage was caused from the disaster, making this the first tornado to do over a billion dollars in damage. It remained the costliest tornado in U.S. history until the Tuscaloosa-Birmingham EF4 in 2011. It is estimated that over 600 people could have died from the tornado if it weren't for the advance warnings. 
A scar left from the tornado was visible in satellite imagery for years after, but it has since faded away. This tornado was not the only violent tornado from the outbreak. An F4 impacted the town of Dover, Oklahoma, killing one and injuring 11 others. Another tornado impacted the small town of Mulholland at F4 strength, unfortunately killing two and injuring 26. The tornado reached a peak width of roughly a mile, but a Doppler on wheels measured winds of 96 miles per hour as far out as 4.3 miles away from the core of the tornado. It also measured winds of 246 to 299 miles per hour. Lastly, another F4 impacted Hayesville in Wichita, Kansas, causing six fatalities and 150 injuries. In total, 79 tornadoes touched down during the outbreak. 40 F0s, 21 F1s, 8 F2s, 6 F3s, 3 F4s, and 1 F5. 46 people died, 825 were injured, and over $1.5 billion in damage was done. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please consider subscribing so you can learn more about weather phenomena on my channel.